Odyssey HD2, Mont Bellevue, Houston. Live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's Paul Gallant. Join the conversation by dialing or texting 713-780-3776. Most interactive sports talk show in Houston. The college football national championship is set. Unfortunately, it will not involve the Texas Longhorns. For many of you guys listening right now, they fell 37-31 to Washington last night while Michigan outlasted Alabama in overtime. It's going to be Michigan and Washington. Meanwhile, on Sunday, the Texans took down the Tennessee Titans in a very convincing manner, 26-3. They will play the Indianapolis Colts Saturday night in Indy. And a playoff spot is on the line with both of those teams at 9-7. and seven. You want to jump in, you can at 713-780-3776. You can also join us on Twitter, at Galan Says. Since we are the most interactive sports talk show in Houston, it has been interesting to take a look at the Twitch today. The Twitch in particular has been going very hard against Nick Casario over the last 15, 20 minutes or so while DJ was in studio with me. And I am curious about how people are feeling about Casario at this specific moment in time. Because you do go back almost a full calendar year right after the Texans beat the Colts the last game of the year. People were blaming Nick Casario not just for firing another black head coach after one year. It was his fault. Why isn't he getting fired too? They were also blaming him for allowing Lovey Smith to try and win the last game of the regular season. If you've listened to me long enough, you know that I think the idea of tanking is morally wrong in the NFL, and I think you're a loser if you root for it. I think it's weird to root for better draft picks. I was rooting for the Patriots to beat the Broncos on Sunday, the Sunday of uh, the birth of our Lord, right? I was rooting for that because I don't want the Patriots to be the worst team in the NFL. Far be it from me. To, to ask for something like that, which might cost them draft picks. But I, I don't think ultimately that the draft picks that you're going to get, like you have that much better of a chance of landing the guy just by having a better pick. You have to have good evaluators. And so newsflash, guess who hasn't been a great evaluator recently? Bill Belichick. Hey. I'd rather win. At least now they've for sure clinched being not the worst team. The Carolina Panthers have clinched. Huzzah! By throwing a drink. Well, not by throwing a drink at a... Uh, at Jaguar Tepper, fans, dude, that was hilarious. It was, I it was great because it was it's so like kind of harmless, but it's also a very funny thing for him to do. And like you could tell he's so upset, but then at the end of the day, it's not like he like punched a guy or like did anything very violent. He just threw a drink at someone. I'd have more respect for him if he slapped him or if he punched like, him. Like Buzz Aldrin, throwing a drink <laughs> on somebody is a lame move. Because you're assuming no accountability on that front. I, I will say, this is this is a, f a finger wag at the ladies out there who have thrown a drink at somebody. The we don't get to retaliate, right? I'm not I'm not suggesting we should get to retaliate, but you know very well that if you throw a drink at a man, he's not going to do anything back, and it's not quite a slap, so you're not going to get charged with assault. It's just enough to be annoying slash the worst. And what Dave Tepper did there, yeah, it's a bitch move. It's a bitch move. You're in your box and you throw a drink at somebody. Like, it's a, that's a bitch move, dude. Uh, hey, have one of your armed security guys go down there and, like, rough them up a little. Rough them up. That would be less of a coward move. This is a coward move, Dave Tepper. Guards. Guards sees him like right do that like and then a, they're like yeah like he's, he's a sultan they hold the fan up they hold the fan up and like by one arm each and he's like punching him like he's an action movie hero from the eighties right as he's like revealing his evil plan mm -hmm. and instead he throws a drink from the box imagine a Jaguars fan by the way getting under your skin a Jaguars fan got under your hey, skin hey Jaguars fans got under the uh, Texan skin. 
There's people at, every week that are retweeting that one Jaguars fan that was like, the AFC South runs through Jacksonville. Trevor Lawrence is the best quarterback in the division. And uh, people are still retweeting that, being like, the Jags are 1-5 in five since the They are. Years. They are. He he might have cost the Jaguars their season. But uh, to bring it back to Nick Casario, we did go yeah, off on a tangent sorry. there. No, no, no. That was a good tangent. I'm glad we brought that up. Nick Casario, I think, has done a good job this year. I, I mean, look. They might have gotten lucky when it comes to C.J. Stroud drafting him second overall. They might have wanted Bryce Young over C.J. Stroud. They're never going to tell us the truth on that front, but I think it's conventional wisdom that anybody who had the first overall pick was going to take Bryce Young in that spot. But I don't have a problem with the Will Anderson trade on the way that a lot of other people do. I think a lot of people believe that a draft pick that is early on is guaranteed to be a good player and that if the Texans had multiple draft picks that they could have added more talent to the roster. And yes, that is technically true. But again, you're playing the lottery and you can't make assumptions that those two picks that you would have had would turn into good players or even starters. Very often, these guys don't end up being good players, don't end up being starters. It's about a 50-50 proposition as far as whether or not the guy's just going to be an NFL player when you take a guy in the first round, no matter where. So... I think a lot of people held that against Casario, and I think it was a little bit unfair. And I do think that considering the cap space that they are working with and considering, my God, the injuries that they've had on the offensive line, I think he's done a pretty good job of finding pieces to plug the holes. And I mean, yet again, you have another guy starting on the offensive line. You got Charlie Heck playing right tackle. Uh, Laramie Tunsil leaves the game for a little bit. So you move George Fant over to left tackle. Uh, They have cobbled together a pretty decent offensive line this year. And finding Derek Barnett, bringing in Kareem Jackson, though, I didn't notice Kareem Jackson a whole lot. I kept on thinking, oh, yeah, wow, Kareem Jackson's having a good game. And it was actually Desmond King who played out of his mind. I had the same thought, too. Wearing 25. Yeah, because he wore 25. I was like, oh, yeah, that's that's not Kareem Jackson. I think also, didn't Desmond King have, like, some sort of late hit or, like, some iffy hit? Oh, it was BS. No, no, but that's when I thought it was Kareem Jackson. (laughs) I still thought it was Kareem Jackson because Kareem Jackson's done that 15 times. When he came in and he belted Tannehill, who spun into him. That was a terrible call. No, I— I don't actually think it was a dirty hit, but it was it was one of those where the where the ref crew like shows it in slow mo, and I'm like, wait, was that Kareem Jackson? I I, I gotta say, King played well on on it was, it Sunday. Was it wasn't just that; he had a couple of good punt returns. I feel bad for him. He's had he he had a near pick six in this game. He has also had two like, fumble scoop and scores called back because he stole the ball from Tannehill. If the quarterback's not down. You should be able to hit the guy as hard as you can. If he's not down, you should be able to hit him. I, I I get the whistle is blowing, but it's not the matrix. If a guy's flying up to finish off a play, you're expecting the guy to stop. And, and he didn't even knock Tannehill over. Like if Tannehill had flopped or something like that, like I, that would have even made a little bit more sense there. But to call an unnecessary roughness there, uh, it, it was such a satisfying ball yeah. don't lie when Christian Harris knocked down that pass in the flats so that they got the goal line stand because that I I hated that call. That that to me is the biggest deal, biggest thing with like the late hits or the late hit out of bounds uh, situations. Like if he doesn't like crush him. Like, what are we doing? Like, right. if you just get the last push on a guy, like like that Kareem Jackson, or Desmond King was not Kareem Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even do that on purpose. Uh, that that play where it's like, I, I feel like there needs to be more contact for the flag to come out there. If it was, I agree. If he blew him up, I would I would understand calling the flag there. But just... He didn't blow him up. Yeah, if you didn't blow him up, then what, like, what are we legislating here? I, I don't understand it myself. It's bizarre... We babied quarterbacks too much, but King played well in this game. And that's a guy, by the way, that the Texans cut and brought back into the fold. Now, you could criticize Casario for cutting King no, earlier in the year. It's what we needed. What we needed at the time and what we need now. It's the motivation he needed. We- wheeling and dealing like he's a fantasy football owner. That's what he's doing. Wheeling and dealing, right. I mean, look, Shaquille Griffin, he, who had some criticism of the way that uh, he was kind of phased out here. Okay, I can, under- I can understand it, but... I mean, King's clearly a more impactful player. Real issue for the Texans, I think, going forward is, okay, like, how how do they figure out how to stop these deep plays from happening against them? Because the offense is going to be limited with the injury to Tank Dell. CJ Stroud is a very good, I think, rapport with Nico Collins. He's going to have to be healthy if the Texans have a chance to win a playoff game or make the playoffs, of course. But I, 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 I look at the Texans, and I, and I feel like 
they will be able to, at the very least, put up a good show against anybody that they go up against in an AFC that I feel like outside of Baltimore right now, it, it, no one's playing very well. And Baltimore's killing everybody. They deserve a lot of credit. They easily won the one seed in the AFC. But you take a look across the AFC. Is there anyone that you're looking at if the Texans do make the playoffs and saying like, oh, they're going to get dusted? Maybe Kansas City because <laughs> past experiences. But I, I, I feel... I feel very good about this Texans team right now. Not good enough to actually predict a victory on Saturday. We do not predict Texans games anymore. They are impossible oh, to predict. They're impossible to predict, and especially when they're on the road, as DJ said in, in the yeah, last hour. Yeah, it's a little yeah. bit hard. It, it is It is hard. That That is why, I mean, you touched on it with DJ, where they still can win the division, and that would be huge for them to win the division. You are depending on the Tennessee Titans, who's a team that uh, the Texans have pants the but two of the last three weeks or three of the last four weeks, whatever it's been. So uh, it's been the holidays. Who cares? Time's a flat circle. <laughs> um, but you you are depending on, you know, Tennessee to make that happen. But if this team could, if you could just like, you know, wiggle your fingers and make them the division winner, like that would be huge for their <laughs> their chances in the first round. Whereas, like you said, in the second round, you're like, you don't feel awesome against any matchup, and you but you also don't feel like, absolutely horrendous about any matchup right. maybe so, I know, maybe the bills would be tough bills bills feel like that'd be a tough matchup for the texans but. 